Well, I guess it's time to get started. I'm Martin Holliday. Um, I was uh, formerly the editor of Green Building Advisor. Um, recently retired from that position, but I'm still writing for GBA. Uh, those, of us, th those of you who aren't familiar with Green Building Advisor, we're a website that focuses on energy efficiency in residential construction. And I've written over 400 articles that are still up on that website. I covered a lot of topics. So if uh, you haven't visited GBA, you should check it out. And if you're willing to become a member, there's a huge trove of back articles and encyclopedia articles on a wide range of topics. Um, we're going to talk about building a simple energy efficient house. Um, a lot of people here are builders or designers who work in a competitive capitalist society where you have to make a profit. You can't always build a really simple energy efficient house if the market doesn't want it. Uh, we're going to talk about simple energy efficient affordable buildings. Um, the market doesn't really reward these factors often, especially if you have a, a high performance home with an unusually high level of air tightness uh, and above code insulation. If that house gets sold, you know, the real estate market doesn't really uh, identify those high performance features as valuable. So uh, because of that reason, most builders are still building uh, homes that barely meet the building code. By the way, and I didn't say this at the beginning, we have an hour and a half, which is a long time, although there's, this is a huge topic. I'm talking about all aspects of construction. So it's hard for me to predict whether I'll never get through my slides or I'll be done in 20 minutes. But I think there's plenty of time here. So I really urge people to raise their hands and ask questions at any point. I think there's lots of opportunities for tangents, but tangents are good because we're really talking about all aspects of construction relating to energy efficiency. They're so we can talk about a lot of stuff. And if you've come here with the idea that you've had questions that bother you, feel free to, to jump in. So home buyers in your area may not want to buy an energy efficient house. You know, they may prefer a house with bling. Uh, I'm going to assume that the builder and the buyer both want an energy efficient house. And you may be lucky enough to be building a spec house, or you may be lucky enough to be able to have a company that specializes in high performance homes and just seeks out those types of people. I think it's the minority of buyers, but they're out there. So, you know, we at Green Building Advisor got a remarkably high number of questions from owner builders or even architects who ended up, for one reason or another, getting construction started before all aspects of their project were nailed down. And you know, believe it or not, there are houses that get built where it's all framed and they haven't really decided where the ducks are going. Or it's all framed and they haven't really decided how they're insulating the cathedral ceiling. Well, at that point, you know, you've run out of options. So number one, plan ahead. And um, there are a lot of things you should plan ahead with. Ideally, the local utility should offer a favorable net metering contract. Now, this is assuming that you're interested in PV or perhaps you're aiming for a net zero goal. Um, that means choose your community because in some towns and in some states, it's hard to get a good net metering contract. That doesn't mean you can't build an energy efficient house, but it changes the idea of you know, how, <clears throat> how sensible it is to invest in a PV system. Um, once you have a site chosen, you could design your house. The design should be site specific. There's a lot of reasons why you don't want to just take a cookie cutter plan and plop it down on any site, you know. Is this a slope? Does the slope slope to the south? Is, a, is there a view? Are there trees? All of these affect the design. And finish the design before construction begins. So we're talking about energy efficient houses that are affordable. That means it's going to be small. Um, you know, I've got opinions on single family homes. Not everyone agrees with me. There's a lot of reasons why some people want a big house and they can afford it. But the, these are my opinions. So you want a small house. So there's a lot of houses out there, a lot of McMansions that were built in the last 20 years that conceivably have no future. I don't know what these 5,000 square foot houses will be turned into if there's any kind of economic downturn. Will they be multifamily homes? Will they be the new teardowns, I don't know. But 
some of these houses are not really amenable to being lived in by one family. So um, these are my own design hints. Um, you want a compact shape without L's, bays, bump outs, dormers, or bonus rooms. For energy efficiency, a simple rectangle is best. You know, people um, ridicule the style of, of house, which is typical of many passive house designs, as the shoebox. The shoebox with the gable roof, like we all drew in kindergarten. But it's a great design. It's uh, affordable, simple, easy to heat, easy to cool. Um, a lot of architects and designers these days just do weird stuff for the sake of being weird. Um, if you want to invest an extra $20,000 in high performance features, the $20,000 has got to come from somewhere. And if you don't end up with, you know, really convoluted roofs, you can save a lot of money on roof framing. And if you don't have weird L's and bump outs, you'll save money that way too. And you can invest that money in air tightness features and better insulation and better windows. Orient the long axis of the house in an east-west direction. This was the classic advice from the 1970s for passive solar design. Uh, my own um, beliefs on passive solar have changed. They've evolved. I don't think the classic passive solar guidelines from the 70s make much sense anymore. A lot of those passive solar designs with a lot of south facing glazing overheat during the day and uh, get too cold at night. Uh, we don't really need to depend on our windows for heat. And in fact, adding extra south facing glazing with the idea that a, a window is a heat gathering appliance is really misguided. You can take the same money you would invest in larger windows and get a much better return elsewhere in the house. So you want your windows. I say design your windows for delight and aesthetics, not for some passive solar principles. So why do we do this? Why do I still say orient the long axis of the house in an east-west direction? One of the main reasons is just so you've got a south-facing roof for your PV system. You can put your PV system in the yard, of course, uh, depending on the size of your lot and have a, a ground-mounted array, but it's convenient to put it on the roof. So um, make your long axis east-west. Make sure your south-facing slope has no plumbing vents or skylights or chimneys. You know, that's where you're putting your solar panels. So don't make a mistake of sticking the plumbing vent on the south side. Put it on the north side. You know, you, that's what attics are for. You can run it wherever you want. Um, and use BOPT or a similar energy modeling program to optimize potential energy upgrades. Um, I don't know how many of you are builders, how many of you are designers, but there's a lot of different ways to do this, but you're soon gonna come to a point when you're designing a house where you have to say how much insulation is too much. Is it worth upgrading to fancier windows? Uh, how do I make these design decisions so that it's a logical choice? Now, BOPT is a free program paid for by your tax dollars. The, uh, and Department of Energy through its NREL lab in Colorado has developed it and made it available. Basically, um, BOPT, which you can download, allows you to change your specs and push a button and run an energy model and compare it to compare different specs and see how the energy performance is. And what it even includes is construction cost figures. Um, and of course, these are arguable because construction costs vary widely from region to region, but you can take their default construction costs and replace them with your own construction costs that are appropriate to your area. So then that construction cost estimator will give you information on what two feet of cellulose costs. And it will tell you whether two feet of cellulose is better than one foot of cellulose because what it does is it compares it to the cost of of PV. So this is the basic uh, method of net zero energy design. When considering any energy measure, compare the anticipated energy savings for that measure with the anticipated energy savings you would get from a PV system with the same cost. Uh, and you don't need uh, a fancy program to do this. You 
need some understanding, you need some type of method of calculating how much energy you save from the measure, but that can be done without a computer program if you understand U factors and heat loss, or you can just use a computer program. But here's an example. Consider a $10,000 energy upgrade measure, perhaps better windows or more attic insulation. It saves $400 in energy per year. You need a method to find out how much you'll save per year. It depends, of course, on your fuel costs as well as you know, how you feel the heat is leaving your building. And then you calculate the rating of a PV system costing $10,000. And 3,300 watts. This will depend on your local cost to install a PV system. You know, nationally it's about $3 a watt. There are some places it's, it's as low as $2 a watt. In some places it's higher. And then you calculate the annual energy electricity production of that, such an array in your location. In this case, that $10,000 system will get you about 4,300 kilowatt hours. That's annual in Boston. And there's a, another free program called PV Watts. It's pvwatts.com, also developed by NREL at taxpayer expense. You just punch in the size of the uh, array and your geographic location, and it tells you the annual production. And you can use their default figures, or you can adjust the uh, array angle and the orientation, whether it's a little off from due south, and it will slightly adjust these figures. So if you know your energy costs, that PV array gives you $642 worth of electricity per year. So now in this hypothetical example that I just pulled out of thin air. And then you can say, what do I want? Do I want to save $400 in fuel costs from extra insulation? Or would I rather just have $642 less of my uh, energy going? You know, your choice on which makes more sense. but. In this example, the PV is a better buy. And this is the standard method for optimizing a net zero house. It's open to criticism for a lot of reasons. Some people say, well, PV, you know, PV uh, will need to be replaced in 30 or 40 years. So that doesn't last forever. Insulation lasts longer. Um, maybe true, maybe not. I mean, there's some old fiberglass insulation in somebody's attic that was, is only 25 years old and it's worthless because the mice and the moisture problems of, you know, we're, we're already pulling out really bad fiberglass insulation from some attic. So it, it depends like everything else. The other uh, variation in comparing PV to insulation is that P, the value of the PV system depends on the net metering agreement, which is a political, not an energy efficiency equation. And when politicians or utility executives uh, decide that they don't like homeowner PV systems because they are making it hard to handle the solar electricity on the grid, and that is happening already in Hawaii, they become less friendly to new PV installations and they change the contract. Um, and whether or not that'll happen in Massachusetts or Vermont or Oklahoma or Texas is often a political matter rather than uh, a technical matter. So BOPT software helps you compare the cost of energy upgrades to PV system costs. BOPT results are most useful when builders tweak the software's construction cost assumptions rather than using the program supplied default values. And that's just because construction costs in Denver are different from construction costs in northern Maine, and only you know what everything costs. So I'm going to be just, I'm throwing my darts at the dartboard, and I'm saying where they're going to land. And I land on a slab on grade foundation. I didn't used to like to say slab on grade foundations, but you want to keep your costs low. This is a hypothetical, affordable, um, uh, uh, energy efficient house. Um, Below grade space, eh, not so nice. Uh, I used to say there's a lot of reasons to have a basement, to, but to keep a basement dry costs a lot of money. Anybody can build a damp basement. Building a perfect dry basement costs almost as much or more as above grade space. So, you know, what, what about a basement? You know, where do I put the furnace? Where do I store the Christmas ornaments if I don't have a basement? Well, build that same space above grade. 
You know, you can always build a storage room or a, a mechanical room above grade if you plan ahead. So I say go for a slab, but you know, you can obviously do a crawl space or a basement if there's a reason that you want or the site requires it. You know, if you're building a slab, remember slab edge insulation. These are two ways to do it from articles on Green Building Advisor. Uh, you can either put the, you need vertical rigid foam on the perimeter. This is often forgotten, but this is where most of the heat leaves the slab. It could be on the exterior of the foundation if you don't have a big termite problem in your area or you can find a way to make that termite proof. It can be if you have a frost well on the inside of the frost well, as is shown in one of these illustrations, but you got to have it. And in many cases, or most cases, you're probably going to want continuous horizontal insulation under the entire slab. That depends on your climate zone. But you, if you don't have the horizontal continuous insulation under the whole slab, you got to have the vertical. You always have to have the vertical uh, insulation at the perimeter. So I'm a big believer in vented, unconditioned attics. I don't like cathedral ceilings. So I don't like dormers. I think you build as many stories as you happen to want and then put a flat ceiling on top of the whole thing. Uh, vented, unconditioned attics are great. If you like to look for roof leaks, you can go up in the attic and look at the sheathing from the underside. That's a lot of fun. You know. No, it's seriously true. Finding a, a roof leak origin in a cathedral ceiling is, is a lot trickier than in an attic. You want to see where the sheathing gets wet. Yeah. <coughs> what do I think about scissor trusses? Scissor trusses are also hard to insulate. Um, you know, some people just say blow them with cellulose, but then depending on the angle, the cellulose can slide. Some people say the cellulose doesn't slide. You end up with a really awkward triangular attic above the cellulose. With difficult access, you have order of construction problems with the guy with the cellulose hose. Where is he sitting when he's blowing the cellulose? Do you do it from above? Uh, of course, but do you do it before the roof sheathing is on? Uh, you know, probably not. But it's not as easy to detail as you think. A lot of people don't plan how they'll insulate it, and they end up using spray foam because they're tearing out their hair and they're running out of options. I don't like scissors trusses, but you can do it. So yeah, dormers and cathedral ceilings, I'm not a fan of them. Um, they often cost more than vented attics. Vented unconditioned attics perform well from a thermal perspective as well as a moisture perspective. You get a little air coming into the soffits, you have some air leaving at the ridge, and you just fill the damn thing up with as much cellulose as you can afford. You know, I like to go for 16 inches at least, but you know, that's a cheap way to insulate. You just get the hose up there. Once the hose is there, you know, deploying the cellulose truck is, is most of the cost. And then, you know, the difference between 12 inches and 16 inches isn't that much money. And again, airtight ceiling is the key. Once you get an airtight ceiling, you're 99% of your way to a well-performing roof assembly. So absolutely get an airtight ceiling and test it with a blower door. Be really careful about electrical penetrations in ceilings. Be careful of your attic access hatch. Uh, you know, be careful of your plumbing vents and all the usual. Keep all your ducts out of this attic. This is not an attic for HVAC or ductwork. Plan ahead. HVAC and ductwork go somewhere else. Well, you know, SIPs is one option. I will say this is my understanding of SIPs. SIPs cost more than other options. Right. I mean, that's the classic SIP argument. You, you save on scheduling and it goes up fast. Um, for those who are not, haven't been following the SIP failures over the years, there are a lot of really dramatic SIP failures. The first cluster was in Juneau, Alaska in the early 2000s. They started on roofs and then they had SIP failures in walls. They were all due to air sealing at the joints. And um, the Building Science Corporation sent Joe Stebrick up there and blah, blah, blah. To make a long story short, if you don't get absolute perfect air tightness details at your SIP seams, you will get air leakage, and that air leakage will result in condensation against the asphalt felt, which is covering that joint. And that moisture will drip, 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 
until you have completely routed the OSB along that spine. And we have several people over into OSB and the roofer goes up to put a new roof on and it's spongy. So they pull all the old shingles off and there's these stripes of rot along the OSB seams. The solution, of course, is perfect air sealing and it's really a, a belt and suspenders approach where not only do you put in the spray foam required by the SIP manufacturer, but you also put wide tape on the interior. And the wide tape on the interior is almost more important than the spray foam. But if those SIP panels are sitting on an intermediary, intermediary beam or purlin, how do you get the tape on that before it rests on the beam? Some people like lay down this peel and stick tape on the beam before the SIP goes up and then they try to peel off the backing and then they slap it up. It, it's a, it's a, you have to think it through and it's not easy. And the problem is with repairing a SIP is the entire SIP is structural. The OSB is glued to the EPS and that becomes a structural unit. So if you have um, compromise the structural integrity by stripes of rot, now you need an engineer to guess whether patching OSB and glue on top of your rotten OSB uh, is enough of a repair from a structural perspective. You don't want to go there. So, you know, I, I, I have my misgivings about SIPs, especially since they cost more than other methods. Well, it's possible to build a house without ducts. You use Lunos fans for ventilation, and uh, you use ductless mini splits for, for heating. Um, but no, you, you, there are a lot of options. Um, not a lot, there are a few options. You have high ceilings and you, you box them in. Uh, you have a, a kind of so-called plenum truss. There are special trusses that have this little bay in the middle where you run the trusses on the inside of the air barrier. They're not perfect solutions. Um, I like uh, especially space heating solutions that don't use ducts, but you're right. Um, I, there, the, it, it can be argued that one of the good reasons to build a, a basement is to have somewhere to put your ducts. That's not a bad reason. It's really important to keep them out of attics. If you want a crawl space, build a crawl space, just build it right. I think the crawl is the worst of all worlds. It's not tall enough to be useful, and it, but it's damp enough to be a pain. Um, you know, if you have a plumbing leak in a basement, you'll go down there to do your laundry and you'll see there's a plumbing leak. If you have a plumbing leak in your crawl space, it might be three years before you see it. And then you've got a little lake with frogs in it on your plastic. <laughs> they love crawl spaces in South Carolina and Tennessee and I can't convince anybody from that area that they don't want a crawl space. It's funny how regions of the country are. In New England, everybody wants a basement. They can't think of another way to build. In North Carolina, everyone thinks a crawl space is the only way to build. In Florida, everyone knows that it's just a slab. And they all pretend it's because of soil conditions, and it's really not. It's just local tradition. <laughs> but all three um, foundation types can be built well. Uh, you know, you have to plan for moisture. You have to plan, you know, you can make below grade space dry. Uh, and you can make a good crawl space, kind of. Uh, Bill Rose, who's a building science at the University of Urbana-Champaign, says that he really has his doubts whether crawl space air could ever be good enough to uh, feel that you can run ducts in a crawl space. There's just too much high risk in his mind of mold to, for him to feel comfortable with ducts in a crawl space. Do I feel that way? I don't know. I've seen some beautiful crawl spaces that seem pretty good to me, but there are building scientists who worry about them. So what if you do want a cathedral ceiling? Uh, plan your roof framing with insulation in mind. Two by tens aren't good enough. Again, this depends on where you are and what your insulation material is, but generally you're gonna have a lot of depth for insulation. Remember that a vented approach only works with a shed roof or a gable roof without any hips, valleys, dormers, or skylights. And this is the key part for most houses. It's rare to find a simple gable roof anymore that really works for vented, but there are such houses. And consider installing rigid foam above the roof sheathing. The best solution for insulated cathedral ceilings is exterior rigid foam. It's just good from all, for all reasons. If you're going to worry about thermal bridging through the framing, the, the, the trusses, the truss cords or the rafters, 
you know, the best thing to do is just to put the rigid foam on top. So then you have to do a calculation that, so that the percentage of your rigid foam, which can be combined with so-called fluffy insulation like fiberglass, make sure the ratio of that works for your climate zone. And we have articles on this on Green Building Advisor. And it's a great way to do it. It's a pretty foolproof way. And it's better than SIPs because, you know, you could do two layers of exterior rigid foam and you can stagger your seams. And once you've staggered your seams, you've really licked the air leakage. And you could also put a bulletproof air barrier between the sheathing and the first layer of foam, and that solves the air leakage problem. It's hard to find a roofer who wants to do that, by the way, or a contractor who wants to put exterior rigid foam on a roof, but it's a great way to go. Plan for an all-electric house. Uh, other people this weekend have presented on the advantages of the all-electric house. We are working towards a future where we will not be using fossil fuels. And if we don't, then our grandchildren or even our children are going to have a big, big mess. They already are. Um, so none of us want to put in gas furnaces, gas boilers, fuel oil furnaces or boilers. All electric is the way to go. We're trying to green the grid. We're trying to change the grid from its current mixture of fossil fuels and renewables to all renewables. Um, I've been visiting some interesting islands where they've got renewable energy goals where they're converting to 100% wind or solar or combinations of wind or solar. One of them is an island in the Caribbean, the island of Ceiba, where they've got the biggest lithium ion battery installation uh, ever, and it's handling most of their electrical load. And the others, uh, the island of El Hierro in Spain, where they've got pumped hydro. And they've got five wind turbines for the small island that are producing more than the island needs for electricity. Whenever the uh, production on wind exceeds the uh, needs of the island, they pump water uphill to a reservoir on the top of the mountain. And when the wind slows down, they run the water through hydroelectric generators. So, you know, it's really fun to see grids that are becoming green and to be inspired to know that it's possible. The, we don't have really a technical barrier to an all renewable energy grid right now, it's just a cost barrier. And if we want to save the planet, we've got to rush to adopt these solutions, and we hopefully will. So space heat is ductless mini splits or ducted mini split. This is the standard approach for energy efficient, high performance house these days. Domestic hot water, you could either use a heat pump water heater or even an electric resistance water heater. It's justifiable under certain circumstances, especially if you've got a big PV system. And for kitchen ranges, I think induction cooktops are the way to go. They're a type of electric cooktop that use much less electricity than a standard electric resistance cooktop. And you do this and then there's no more gas in your house. There's no fuel oil. So climate change concerns require switching away from combustion. If you do include a PV system, you may achieve net zero. In coming years, the carbon footprint of the electricity grid will be dropping. And this last item I've been reading more and more about, it's really scary. Natural gas pipelines leak, making natural gas, according to some calculations, worse than coal from a global warming perspective. This is a huge story. There's been some good work right here in Massachusetts on this issue, but every aspect of the natural gas pipeline system leaks. The fact that we have a really old natural gas piping system, especially in New England, a lot of these pipes were laid 100 years ago, 50 years ago, under our streets. They're leaking. You know, they can go with natural gas detectors at manholes, and these manholes are just like continuously letting natural gas uh, into the atmosphere. In some cases, it's an explosion risk. Um, and um, when you do those calculations of the gas that is leaking, it is in many cases worse than coal. So we not only need to stop burning natural gas, we need to be capping our natural gas pipeline neighborhood by neighborhood. We really need to be shutting these off and capping them. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. Okay, so now I'm talking about uh, hot water and hot water plumbing. So cluster the wet rooms. This is, uh, Gary Klein is a uh, energy efficiency expert in California who's interested in domestic hot water. And he's focused like a laser on the idea that our hot water wait times are longer than they used to be. He says when we grew up, his generation grew up in the 50s and 60s, 
it didn't take too long for the hot water to come to your faucet. And now it's taking two or three times as long. Well, why? Because we have low flow faucets. And the low flow faucets mean that we, the flow is slower. Um, and our houses are bigger. Uh, a lot of times, especially out west, they put the water heater in the garage and the master bathroom is on the other side of the house. And we're tended to be putting larger and larger plumbing pipes, unnecessarily large plumbing pipes. So you put all these factors together and you know people turn on the water faucet. And most hot water draws, according to Gary Klein's most recent research, um, never have hot water reaching the tap. So you go to the kitchen, and his classic example is you're, you're washing your teacup. You turn on the hot water, or you just take that single lever faucet and you put it straight up, and it's half hot, half cold. And you do something, you fart around for just uh, you know, 30 seconds or a minute. The hot water never even reaches the faucet, but it left the water heater. So a high proportion of the water that you've heated with your natural gas or your electricity doesn't even reach the faucet. And most calculations for uh, hot, domestic hot water don't keep, uh, calculate that. But there are several solutions to this. One I'm talking about here is cluster the wet rooms, which means have a design so that your bathrooms and your kitchen are clustered. <coughs> Research systems are one approach if you have a master bathroom that's far from the kitchen. There are good research systems and terrible research systems. You know, the ones in most hotels uh, are running 24 hours a day. And that's why in your hotel room, when you wake up in the morning, you get that instant hot water. If you do that in a house, and believe it or not, people do. Some designers will just put in a pump. And, you know, it's tremendous wastage. You're, if you have an on-demand switch in your bathroom, and they make them a Takeo demand pump is one. Uh, you can either have it on a toggle switch. Some people put it on an occupancy sensor, but I don't like that because if you're going into your bathroom just to grab the comet or something, then you're, you're wasting hot water. So, and, and the third solution is actually two water heaters. One water heater near the kitchen and one water heater near the remote bathroom. And it's not as crazy as it sounds. Sometimes a little um, all ele um, electric resistance water heater under the sink in your bathroom or wherever it'll fit may make more sense than these ridiculous long wait times. But I th I'm convinced that Gary's right, that this is basically a design issue. If we have designers in this room, you know, pay attention. Cluster your wet rooms. Um, tr do a better job. You can uh, have a house with four bedrooms without putting you know, the bathrooms as far apart as we tend to do. E with either copper tubing or PEX tubing, you can do either home run systems or tube and branch. So, the question is tube and branch versus uh, home runs. And I think the jury is a modified um, um, trunk and branch system is the best. The, the home runs, if 100% of the house is home run, you tend to get a lot of tubing and a lot more wastage in the hot water than at least sending a trunk to that remote bathroom if you end up with a remote bathroom. The point source tankless, um, you know, there's, there's two types. There's electric and the gas. The electric ones tend to be a problem because if you really are meeting, if you're meeting the needs of a small lavatory and not the lavatory and the tub or shower, the electrical draw might not be much. But once you get the, you know, three gallon a minute flow, about four or five gallon a minute flow, then you start to need a 100 amp service just for that one point source water heater, which means your whole house needs a 200 amp service. And the electric utilities hate it because if you had you know, 10 houses in a neighborhood and they all have point source electric, instead of heating your water gradually over the day, everyone wakes up in the morning, has a shower at once, and all of a sudden, boom, you know, the utility has this huge load. So I think from a green building perspective, we need to care about grid stability. We need to, uh, the high uh, investment in the electrical wiring is something we should avoid. And it's hard if we're looking for a future with renewables, which is solar and wind, to think that we're gonna be able to have those instantaneous demands with electric. And if you wanna do it with gas, you can do it with gas, but again, we're back to the combustion issue, so. Uh, a lot of people make every window in the house operable. Um, from a use standard that really isn't necessary. Go around your own house, look at each window, think when was the last time I opened this window? 
You're going to need some windows in your house you use for ventilation regularly, other windows you never open. Um, if you pay attention to this issue, you'll figure it out pretty fast. Uh, fixed windows have less air leakage and they cost less. So uh, a good designer thinks this through. You don't need to make every window an operable window. Uh, casement windows or awning windows, I guess hoppers too, are preferable to double hung or sliders. And most people know that, but there's this kind of sentimental attachment to the double hung window, especially in New England. But from uh, an air leakage perspective, you really want that good seal and that cam action lock. If you, uh, if you can convince the homeowner. This is size your windows for comfort and delight. So you want your windows to be what your windows should be. Remember, you're not putting an all glazed south facade because you think it's magic and it's free heat. It's not free heat. Um, the disadvantage to overglazing your house happens both by overheating and overcooling. You don't get the sun when you think you need it. So just size the windows the way they should be. Forget those passive solar rules on south facing glazing and your life will be simpler. The double glaze versus triple glaze, I've kind of flipped on this issue. Um, it used to be that all the energy nerds said we have to get triple glazing. I'm not as convinced anymore, especially in Massachusetts, uh, whether the upgrade to triple makes sense. It's certain, there, I doubt if triple glazing upgrade makes sense from an economic perspective. Um, it really depends, however, on how much you're paying for your triple glazed windows. There are some inexpensive triple glazed windows out there that are pretty good. There's also some double glazed windows with very sophisticated low E coatings that perform almost as well as the cheapo triple glaze. So we have to first of all check the actual U factor and the performance of the windows. We have to compare the price. But in many cases, a good double glazed window is adequate from a frankly economic perspective where you can't justify a window that's 80% more or 100% more in cost simply on the energy savings alone. That said, triple glazed windows are almost always more comfortable than double glazed. And I always say in Vermont, it's when it's below zero. You know, starts to be five below, you're sitting in your living room reading a book, and it's really nice to have that triple glazed window. You don't feel that chill. You know, what, what's really happening is people call it, oh, I can feel the breeze coming in the window. It's not the breeze. Your skin is radiating heat, and the radiation from your heat to the cold surface of the adjacent window feels like a breeze. And once you add that third pane, uh, you've raised the temperature of the inner surface of the glass, and therefore the radiant effect from your skin. There's not as much of a delta T between your skin temperature and that window glass, and you will not radiate heat as fast, and you'll be more comfortable. So for that matter alone, I like triple glazed windows. Whether a builder can justify them on houses he's building for a profit is harder to say. Um, what's happened in this equation of designing a net zero house over the last 10 years is PV continues to get cheaper and cheaper. So those of us who compare the cost of PV to an energy efficiency upgrade are finding that a code minimum ho home is actually pretty good if you really do meet code. Now the problem where I live in Vermont is most builders don't really meet code. But if you meet code in the sense that you, know, you really meet the air tightness targets and you really provide the actual R value that you should be, um, then that house is pretty good. Uh, and maybe close to optimum for a PV equipped house if you're simply going on the price of the photovoltaics. That was not the case 15 years ago because PV was much more expensive. So we used to say you need the triple glazed windows, the R40 walls, the R60 attics, and now you know it's a little harder to say. So now we need to actually use our brains and say what kind of house do I want for comfort? Maybe I want upgraded air tightness, upgraded windows, upgraded insulation for comfort reasons, for the security that I know my energy bills will be low forever, and I won't depend so much on PV because PV is a little bit more of rolling the dice on what the utilities will give me for that PV investment. So um, that's one thing that's changed on the double versus triple. Uh, 
issue. So clearly uh, pay attention to air tightness. Air sealing measures give you the biggest bang for your buck. That's it, period. Seal, seal, seal. You really want to get it down to one ACH 50 or lower. Um, and test your envelope, obviously, with a blower door. I hope that everyone attending this conference is testing their house with a blower door. It's pretty much code mandated now. Um, that said, the code is not enforced in many parts of New England or the, the country as a whole. But um, we, we really need, you know, caulk, gasket, spray foam, tape. We need to do this stuff. That's the biggest bang for your buck. Spend an extra week, spend an extra thousand dollars in air sealing materials. That's where you're going to get your uh, rewards for your investment. Include insulation that exceeds minimum code requirements. You know, I stuck in this because we're in Massachusetts and Justin chastised me, you know, yesterday saying that we're going to be agnostic for geographical regions. We want everybody who came from California to feel welcome. So th this is Climate Zone 5 and I apologize. Other climate zones are different, but R15 basement walls, R20 above grade walls, and R49 ceilings are code minimum. And I've always said try to exceed them. You know, these are code minimums, especially if you've got an attic where there's plenty of room, you know, to, to get a cellulose hose up there. You know, go for R60 for the ceiling. It's pretty easy. Anyway, upgrading walls is a little harder, but you're probably going to be want to want to be addressing thermal bridging through studs one way or another. And if you are, you can usually uh, do better than an R20 wall and basements. R15 anyway, the trouble with the R15 basement requirement is it's still one of the most widely ignored insulation requirements in the code. I don't know why, but uh, building inspectors around the country have not really been enforcing basement insulation as well as they should have. So let's at least get that R15. Roof design, um, I started out as a roofer. Uh, simplicity beats complexity. I like roofs with no hips, valleys, dormers, or skylights. Any roof penetrations belong on the north side of the roof, not the south side, so you can put that PV array up there when you can afford it. Insulate the attic floor, not the roof slope. Now these are my guidelines. You know, if you want to do valleys and hips, there's ways to do it. Um, you should understand your flashing basics. Uh, there are still people who have a sidewall meeting a roof that don't know what kick-out flashing is. If you don't know what kick-out flashing is, look it up. Um, flashing is a, an important skill that is often done poorly. You know, if you have a, an otherwise perfect, you know, $400,000 house without kick-out kick out flashing, it's amazing how fast you can rot the wall. The water that dribbles down that roof against the sidewall and falls straight down along that wall. Boy, you see these photos of a four-year-old house where they pull off the siding and the OSB is just rotten. It's all gone. So it's important to understand your flashing. I like steel roofing or asphalt shingle roofing. That's just my preferences. This is my presentation, so I get to tell you what I like. <laughs> um, you know, uh, asphalt shingles, a lot of people say, oh, it's petroleum, oh, it's ugly. But you know, asphalt shingles are affordable. They're really easy to repair. You can put something in and patch it in a way you can't do as easily with steel roofing. Uh, it's very versatile. Um, you know, so plain old asphalt shingles have their virtues. Building high R walls. So we supposedly in this room know why we don't want thermal bridging through studs, but in case there's any uh, uncertainty, uh, studs have R value, but they have lower R value per inch than insulation. So if you look at a standard insulated wall with an infrared camera on a cold day, you'll see red stripes at the studs because the heat is leaving the, through the wall through the studs and you'll have solid areas between the red stripes because the insulation's working better. So we solve that thermal bridging problem one of two ways, exterior rigid foam or double stud walls. And I, I really don't have a dog in this fight. I, I ha, there's a lot, I've, you know, either way works. Um, when I have built high R walls, I've gone with exterior rigid foam. Uh, I know a lot of builders I really respect who love double stud walls. They find them more affordable and more intuitive for framers. They just build one wall and then they build another. A lot of Framers like it because their exterior window and siding insulations are conventional. They don't have to learn about 
you know, how to attach furring strips through foam, how to detail windows. There uh, aren't as many issues there. Uh, but both ways work just fine as far as I'm concerned. If you're buying a lot of exterior rigid foam, consider using reclaimed foam. Uh, obviously, if you're a small builder or an owner builder or doing you know, one house a year, that's easier than if you're a big production builder. But you can buy reclaimed foam for one third the price of new foam. Uh, a lot of it is really clean. This foam tends to come from uh, roofers who tear off a roof. And some of the roofs they tear off for a variety of reasons aren't that old. Um, you can uh, usually go and inspect a lot of rigid foam before you buy it. And you want stuff that doesn't have busted corners and looks pretty clean. Um, but it's a good way to go. If you're doing exterior rigid foam, you've got to learn your window installation details. My mantra is flash the rough opening, not the window. And a lot of people think, how do I flash the window? And they're worrying about the interface with the flange and some other part of the wall, like the rigid foam or the sheathing. But really what you want to do is flash the rough opening before you even put the window in it. If your window opening is properly flashed and watertight, that means you've got the rough sill covered with flashing with either an interior dam or a slope sill or both. You've got jam flashing that overlaps on your sill, rough sill flashing. And you've got a plan for the head. And then basically, you've handled the water. Put your window in. The window, at th that point, you care about air leakage, but you're not really flashing the window. You flash the rough opening. Double stud walls, there's a lot more to talk about than we can do here. You do have some issues to consider if you're designing a house with double stud walls. Which wall is the bearing wall? You can do the, either the interior or the exterior wall can be your bearing wall. But you should know which of the two is the bearing wall and how your load paths carry the roof load down to the foundation. If you don't know that, then you haven't planned ahead. You can use cellulose, mineral wool, or fiberglass. You're not going to be using spray foam in general with a double stud wall, although I've seen people do it for a variety of reasons. But the classic flash and bat wall, which is spray foam plus something, depends on the right ratio between the spray foam and the fluffy insulation in order to avoid moisture problems. And a double stud wall is so thick, usually 10, 12, 14 inches thick, that if you want that fluffy insulation, rigid uh, spray foam insulation ratio to be correct, you're going to end up with a lot of spray foam, and that's expensive. What happens is if you put just two inches of spray foam there and fill the rest with cellulose, the cellulose is making the interior surface of the spray foam colder. Interior fluffy insulation cool, reduces the temperature of that spray foam. The spray foam becomes a condensing surface. That's the basic philosophy behind these ratio questions. If the more spray foam you have and the less fluffy insulation has, the warmer that interior surface is. And we're always trying to avoid these cold surfaces inside our walls. And people who don't understand this basic ratio issue will sometimes have a 12-inch thick cavity, and they'll call their spray foam guy up and say, give me two inches. It's good for air soothing. And Sometimes it works, but it, it does put you in the risky t category because you're really doing a flash and bat job without doing the math. So keep it simple. Fill it with mineral wool or fill it with cellulose. That way, what you're doing is you're designing a traditional wall that, where the sheathing drives to the exterior. So you're going to assume that the sheathing gets a little damp every February. Studies prove that it does but that that's relatively harmless because when April and May come around, that sheathing will dry to the exterior. And that method is, seems to be working. Uh, it's the standard method. We've been building houses now for 60, 70 years. It works with double stud walls. You can reduce the risk somewhat by a smart vapor retarder on the interior side. That smart vapor retire will lower the rate of moisture transmission from the interior during the winter towards that cold sheathing and keep that sheathing somewhat drier. The outsolation, the exterior rigid foam rules 
are similar or identical to the flash and bat rules. And here's the rule. The colder the climate, the thicker the minimum thickness of the rigid foam must be. The thicker your studs, the thicker your rigid foam must be. If you move north to a colder climate, what you're worried about is the temperature of the wall sheathing in January. You don't want that sheathing to be so cold that moisture accumulates or ice forms. So, because, and here's the reason why it matters more with exterior foam than with the conventional wall. With exterior rigid foam, you've reduced the drying potential to the exterior. We've changed the way the wall dries out. The traditional wall I described, which we've built for 50 to 70 years, every April and May the sheathing dries to the exterior. If you slap on some polyisocyanurate, especially if it's foil faced, you're not drying out your sheathing to the exterior anymore. So the only way to keep that wall safe is to make sure that the moisture never accumulates. That means we need to keep the sheathing warm, and to keep the sheathing warm we need a high enough R value. So we've got the chart in GBA. Other people have, have produced similar charts. And in fact, it's in the building code. But you know, you may need two inches in Massachusetts and three inches in Vermont, depending on the depth of the studs. If you have two by four studs, you can get away with thinner foam. Why? Because the less fluffy insulation you have on the interior, the more your interior is warming your sheathing. But when you go from 2x4 studs to 2x8 studs, and you put 8 inches of fiberglass in your walls, what are you doing? You're making your sheathing cold again. Cold sheathing is dangerous. That's a ratio you've got to pay attention to. So um, your choice, you can build with 2x4 studs, you can build with 2x6 studs or 2x8 studs, but in all cases, think about whether your sheathing is going to be wet and how it's going to dry out. Rock wool, you're, good point, I'm glad you brought that out, has the advantage of drying, of being vapor permeable. It doesn't interfere with outward drying. So that's a, a, a huge advantage of exterior rock wool. It's a little trickier to install. You tend to have to go with the denser varieties. And then when you put your furring strips on it, it's a little bit squishy. But it's, it's great for outward drying, so the ratio doesn't matter. That's a good point. Well, I mean, ideally, you know how your wall is insulated if you're slapping anything on the exterior. So I'm, I mean, you may or may not know, but you should. I mean, if you have a two by four wall with zero insulation, and they still exist, you can put almost any kind of foam you want on the outside because it's going to dry inward on one side of the foam. It's going to dry outward on the other side of the foam. And you know, 100% of the insulation is in that foam, and therefore the sheathing will stay warm. So you, you have to think it through. Um, if you have an old building that has its two by sixes that appears to be pretty well insulated, you have to follow the same rules. Steve? Yeah, so I'm sorry I've been quiet for too long. times. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem I have with this is you have this magical moisture source, right? I'm not saying it's not there. But the whole argument is predicated on, well, we can't allow moisture through the wall. So my first question is always, well, where is this moisture coming from? And where is it generated? Now, we can sit there and say cooking and all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. But if I maintain the moisture levels inside the house via ventilation and I have a very airtight assembly, then the argument that you're making, I don't believe is as, is as valid as building a really poor wall and not caring about the interior environment and just slapping up some rigid foam on the outside. I certainly buy the argument that the thicker the wall, the less energy at the condensing surface. I, I get all of that. But the, the whole moisture source always bothers me because I came from the family that said moisture in the vapor form isn't a problem until it condenses. So obviously the warming of, of the condensing surface is one thing. But to create a problem, you need a serious amount of vapor diffusion to generate a large amount of bulk water to create a problem. And I don't see that all well, the time. Well, Steve, you're, you're, you're right. And I'm going to respond two different ways. One is, Steve, it's absolutely right. The higher the interior relative humidity during the winter, the more dangerous these conditions are. 
So a one way to prevent rotten sheathing is to have a hygrometer and adjust your ventilation rate to be sure that you never exceed a predetermined interior RH. If you guys are builders or architects, is that the way you want to assure the safety of your building after the homeowners move in? That's up to you. But Steve is right, if you can maintain 28% RH or even 30% RH consistently for the life of the building, your risk is far lower. You can forget a lot of what I said. If, however, somebody moves in there with an asthmatic child or a child with a lung issue and is convinced they've got to run the humidifier in the child's bedroom, you as a builder can't control that. And so you've now created a wall that depends on its integrity on the maintain maintenance of a ventilation system and the operation of a fan. So my argument is you want a robust assembly that can handle 50% RH. Now, uh, Joe Stiebrick just went through three winters in his test hut in his backyard. He built this uh, cathedral ceiling. He got the <coughs> manufacturers in the Department of Energy to pay for it. He got a grant to run some great studies. And basically, if he ran it at 30% RH or he let the RH float between 20 and 40% the first winter, it was pretty good. It was safe. And then the last two winters, he jumped the interior RH up to 50% to see what would happen, and he got failures. He got wet spots. He got problems. So Joe and Coda Wayno, the researchers who ran the program, concluded, we can't recommend this. We can't recommend a cathedral ceiling system. And I'm talking about a specific system that wasn't really code compliant, so you guys don't have to worry. But he said, we can't recommend it because we can't assure that the homeowners who move into our homes are always going to run their houses at 28% RH or 30% RH. So that's my basic argument. It, it will work for your own home if you can get everyone in the family to comply. Right. Yeah, well, let's talk about vapor barriers. First of all, there are no requirements for interior vapor barriers in the code. There's a requirement for vapor retarders, and there's a difference. So you don't need poly on your walls ever. Poly is not code required. You do need some type of vapor retarder in New England in you know, climate zones 4 north or 5 north. I guess it's 4 north. Um, so that means craft facing on fiberglass and or vapor barrier, vapor retarder primer paint or uh, a smart vapor retarder, retarder like membrane. All of those will do it. So you don't need poly. But um, Brian is absolutely right that when you have an interior vapor retarder or vapor barrier, including poly, it changes the performance of the walls. And Joe has lately said in most cases interior poly, although he doesn't like interior poly because of the dangers when you air condition heavily in summer, it still tends to protect walls in winter. And even walls with exterior rigid foam that are not drying well to the exterior in Quebec and Ontario are staying out of trouble because in Quebec and Ontario, they're still using interior poly. So now we get into a case where a maligned and uh, misunderstood interior vapor barrier that we've been telling people, let's stop using it, is somewhat protective in a very humid house that might be otherwise dangerous. And these rules are tricky to determine because you can't really figure out how these pluses and minuses, when you slow down the exterior drying rate and you slow down the wetting rate and the drying rate by interior poly, at what point are you, is your sheathing getting a little wetter with every annual cycle? And at what point is the sheathing getting a little drier with every annual cycle? The way the building scientists determine this, there are two ways. You use WOOFI, which is a uh, a program that's a hydrothermal program that calculates the moisture flows and in theory can model it. But the question is, is it really modeling it correctly? Or you build several test huts and you watch them. I don't like to give builders advice based on all these variables. It's just too complicated. I like really robust wall systems. And that's why I stick to my traditional advice on the ratio of rigid foam and don't use poly. And the, the, there have been failures in houses with interior poly during the air conditioning season, a few famous failures. You usually have to have three things wrong to get this type of failure, but the trouble is when you run air conditioning in a house with interior polyethylene, that poly come, becomes a condensing surface from inward solar, solar vapor drive. And if you have an assembly that allows exterior moisture that may be in your siding, 
to be driven inward by solar exposure after a rainstorm, you are opening yourself up to condensation on the back of the poly that puddles on your bottom plate. And believe me, it's happened, and there's a famous bankruptcy in Ohio, a builder called Zaring Homes. And Zaring Homes made two or three mistakes that contributed to this problem in addition to the interior poly, but it's, it's worth noting that poly is not without its own risks. Okay, so now we're on to heating systems. I'm looking at my watch here. Okay, start with a room by room load calculation. Um, this, it's amazing how few people really do this or do it right. Remember that most HVAC contractors are incapable of performing load calculations, although they'll tell you they will. So you need to either learn how to do your own load calculations by the software or learn a pencil and paper method that you feel comfortable with or you need to hire a building expert or a mechanical engineer to do it for you because you can't design a heating system if you don't know your loads. And most um, HVAC contractors are using rules of thumb or just plain guessing. Even when they have manual J software that they've paid for, they just guess on the inputs or they exaggerate, they'll put the wrong air leakage ratios, they'll overestimate the size of the ventilation system, they'll assume that the windows perform worse than actual windows and they'll get the result they want by inputting bad data. The trouble is uh, we design our heating systems for uh, design conditions and the design conditions are just a few hours a year. So there'll be two days in January and one day in February when you hit design conditions. Most of the time you're operating your heating system at um, less than design conditions and therefore it will be a partial load. You absolutely have to have multi-stage equipment or, or continuously variable equipment for that. But even that said, um, we are oversizing our equipment by a factor of two, three, and four in many cases. And so uh, it's so oversized that the ramping down isn't adequate. So radiant floors, it still comes up. There was, uh, I was in an earlier presentation today where someone was asking about radiant floor heat. I'm not a fan of radiant floor heat. It's expensive. Uh, I'm going to explain why I think that ductless mini splits and ducted mini splits are the way to go. The good thing about mini splits is they provide heating as well as cooling, so you don't need to have a redundant heating system. Uh, radiant floors do not provide cooling and almost everybody wants cooling these days. So um, the comfort uh, associated with uh, radiant floors is mainly experienced in really leaky, badly insulated buildings because those buildings need hot floors because the heat loss is so high and you floor feels warm. If you have a super insulated house, the air temperature, the temperature of your floor is never going to be elevated enough so it'll feel warm because, you know, a well-built house doesn't need much heat. So um, these are overkill systems. You still meet homeowners who are convinced that their dream home that they've been wanting to build for their whole lives has got to have radiant heat. Um, I try to talk people out of it. So we end up with systems with ducts uh, in a lot of cases. I mean, you may be building a house with a conventional furnace. You may be having a ducted mini split system. Uh, a lot of duct systems are poorly installed. These are the basics. Galvanized ducts are better than flex ducts. Ducts should be indoors, not outdoors, so you don't really want them in a ventilated crawl space or an attic. Duct systems shouldn't leak. It sounds pretty obvious, just like plumbing systems, but <coughs> They, most of them do, so they, that means they should be tested with a duct blaster. Don't neglect return system design. Boy, this is something that for years people just didn't care about. They would just put a big register in the hallway wall and run some kind of 12 by 12 back to the furnace and call it good. So what that means is when you're in your bedroom at night and you close the door, the house is being, the room is being pressurized by the supply system and there's no way for the return air to go from that closed door bedroom back to the furnace. So you could undercut the door, maybe that works, but really the math is bad on door undercuts. You could do a jump duct or uh, some kind of transfer duct and those have noise transmission problems although they can work. Or you could have the Cadillac system that really has a return grill in every single room. But you have to think it through. You can't just like not know how the air is getting from your bedroom back to the furnace. It's got to have a path. And you as a designer need to be able to answer that question. 
Well, the high velocity duct systems can work, but you know, you take an energy efficiency hit. I mean, the ideal duct system is oversized. You want big, fat ducts that allow air to easily get where it's going. You want as few elbows as possible. All of those length, small diameter, and elbows all introduce static pressure. And the static pressure is only overcome by the fan. And if you need to run a high power fan to overcome a small diameter duct or a system with a lot of elbows, um, then your energy costs go up and more and more of your energy is devoted to distribution. Now, a big fat fan motor in your basement isn't a huge penalty in the winter, arguably, because the hot motor is at least putting some heat in your house. But if it's an air conditioning system, that hot motor is actually adding to your cooling load and you get a double whammy in the cooling season. So I'm not a fan of these high velocity, tiny diameter ducts. You really want to design for minimum static. There's some new criteria for deeply buried ducts you're talking about in the attic. And yeah, they can work as long as you follow the rules. The traditional worry it was in the southern US where attic air is hot and humid during the cooling season and a thinly covered duct, the exterior of the duct might be cold enough to allow condensation. So the attic air, the hot, humid attic air would have contact with the cold duct and it would start to drip. And that did happen. So you, you need not only cellulose insulation or some type of insulation above the duct, you need an insulated duct with a polyethylene jacket just to be sure that you have some protection against moisture flow that might contact a cold surface. At, and in some climates, that means you need double duct. They don't yet sell insulated duct work with that's high enough R value. So they call it the sleeping bag method. You take the one insulated duct and you slide it into another insulated duct to get the insulated duct thick enough to avoid the condensation issues. And if you're willing to go through all that, it can work. And, but that again, is, these are Florida rules. Up here in New England, it's less of a problem. But I wrote an article with the rules in it uh, on Green Building Advisor, so just search for buried ducts. There are a couple of articles on it. So yeah, here we are. Short ducts are better than long ducts. Large diameter ducts are better than the small diameter ducts. And duct runs should have as few elbows as possible. So air source heat pumps, this is the go-to solution for uh, high performance homes now all over the country. I talk about convergent evolution. We had people everywhere playing around with different ways to build you know, uh, a, a low energy house. And it seems like we're getting, we're all doing, coming to a consensus. And the, the ductless mini splits or ducted mini splits are the consensus solution for these high performance homes. The need for dehumidification varies by climate and location. I mean, dehumidification is an issue with all high performance homes no matter how you heat them. And it tends to be just a function of the fact that they have low loads, so you're not running any kind of cooling or heating equipment a lot of times. And if you're ventilating, you're often bringing in humidity. And in the shoulder seasons, you have problems that require, in many cases, just a, a standalone portable dehumidifier. And I don't think that has anything to do with mini splits. That has to do with the fact that you're building a very tight, high performance home. Um, and, you know, Ventilation air, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword. We all like ventilation, but in many seasons, the more you ventilate, the more you're bringing humidity into your house. So there's no free lunch. If you like fresh air, you've got to handle the humidity. And that's where most of the humidity load comes from in a well-built house is the ventilation. So, you know, install an HRV or an ERV. I joke, it doesn't have to be a Zender. Zenders are great units. Ten to twelve thousand dollars installed. Um, some people balk at that, so you know, get a different brand if you can't uh, afford a Zender. I used to say a lot of small homes do just fine with the uh, exhaust-only ventilation system. I'm kind of coming around more and more to the need for a, a good ERV or HRV with a, with dedicated duct work because of more and more research on what. Uh, carbon dioxide levels in houses are doing to our mental acuity. It turns out we need more fresh air than we used to think. There's increasing signs that when the carbon dioxide level rises above 1,000 
parts per million, we all get a little sluggish. And there's plenty of measurements in bedrooms with closed doors of well above 1,000 ppm. And that's where we're spending eight hours a day. So fresh air in your bedroom is important. Uh, there's a guy in Vermont who did some excellent research on this. He was measuring uh, CO in closed bedrooms, uh, CO2, excuse me. Uh, and um, they, they were not good. And he said, basically, he, at, at, after he finished his research, he kicked the dog out of the bedroom, because the dog makes a difference. <laughs> and he always sleeps with the window open. Now, you can do whatever you want, but you know, I, I, it turned my thinking around. And if possible, if you can afford it, what you really want is a, a good HRV or an ERV with a dedicated ventilation ductwork system that services the bedrooms. That's really the way to go. It costs more than we'd like. It costs more than the systems I used to recommend, but I've come around to feeling they're important. In, in very limited instances, the CERV, the CERV, or the Minotaire, Alex Gagné is here from Quebec with his Minotaire uh, at the trade show, and he'll talk to you all about it, is basically a ventilation unit that has a small air source heat pump. The trouble with these units is, at this point, they're really not designed for full heating and cooling. They, you know, unless you're a remarkably small, well-built house, you're still going to need a heating and cooling system. I mean, it doesn't surprise me that we need more than one piece of equipment. I mean, in, in my kitchen, I have a refrigerator and an oven, you know, and a blender. They all do different things. It's not like I, you know, if I'm making a daiquiri, I'm not going to use the oven. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you want to invent, yes, you can uh, invent an appliance that does all three. It's like I used to say, they used to sell like a uh, combination record player, eight track tape player, VCR TV in one unit. And you could, you know, and then when one of those units breaks, you have to replace the whole damn thing. There's no, I mean, I can build a combination toilet refrigerator. But <laughs> when the refrigerator breaks, now I need a new toilet. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Nothing lasts forever. You can try to combine many appliances with many functions into one box, but it's going to break. Somebody's got to fix it. So if you want a good ventilation system, get a good ventilation system, and then you still need a heating and cooling system. You know, if you try to use ducts for both delivering space heat and cooling and ventilation, lots of people do it. By the way, almost every HRV or ERV manufacturer gives you instructions on how to piggyback their units on heating ductwork. Do I like it? No. And the main reason is a conditioning problem. It's really hard to get the airflows commissioned so that you know how much airflow you're getting. In the shoulder seasons, the heating equipment won't be running. The big air handler fan will be off. You're going to be depending on the ERV fan to distribute the air. You'll get so many CFM. Once that air handler or furnace is operating, that kicks on. Suddenly, you've got an 800 watt fan blowing tremendous CFMs through your ductwork. And that's going to start pulling far more ventilation air through your, it's going to upset the system. If you have dedicated ventilation ducts, you size the ducts for your desired airflow, often only 60 CFM. You commission the system by measuring the airflow. And then you deliver your heat some other way. And you, they're not fighting each other. You need a big fat blower to deliver heat. Even a ducted, um, um, ducted mini split is going to have a higher CFM flow to deliver space heat than you would need for ventilation. So they're not well matched. The vast majority of installed ventilation systems in America since ASHRAE 62.2 committee created its ventilation standard, whatever, 12 years ago, uh, do not function correctly. They do not deliver the airflow required by the standard. Um, and study after study has visited installed systems in new homes and found they're vastly overventilating, underventilating, installed backwards, turned off, unplugged, clogged or not working. We have a, a real crisis in our ventilation systems. They're, they're never commissioned and they're, they're often just unbelievably backwards and upside down. So, you know, I think we need to focus on it better. We need to buy better equipment. We need to install dedicated ductwork. We need to commission it. 
um, because we're just doing a bad job. We're coming down to the end here, I think. So exhaust-only systems have poor distribution of fre fresh air, especially in bedrooms. That's why I've moved away from recommending them. Central fan integrated supply ventilation systems for type that introduces a little exterior air into your return air plenum are rarely well designed and properly commissioned. And you know, uh, the, the, uh, the theory is great and when Building Science Corporation installs them they work perfectly and they're the least expensive type of ventilation system that provides good air distribution. The trouble is the only way they work well is if somebody measures airflow and we can't find HVAC contractors who measure airflow. Um, I guess it could be argued that that's a problem with all ventilation systems. It's less of a problem with an ERV or an HRV because there's better instructions from them and the devices themselves have a way of addressing overventilation and underventilation in a way that these outdoor air ducts don't. Domestic hot water, the two choices are basically electric resistance water heater and a heat pump water heater. I love heat pump water heaters. They've become far more dependable than they used to be. The only problem is you have to have somewhere to put them. Um, you know, in down south they put them in the garage. Uh, we don't usually put plumbing in the garage in New England because the pipes freeze. Uh, you can put them in the basement, but you want to have it in a basement room that's big enough. It will make your basement colder when it's operating. It makes hot water by lowering the temperature of the air in the room in which it's installed. If you try to put it in a closet or a tiny mechanical room, that room will be very cold very fast. At, at, at one point, it'll get so cold that the uh, the air source heat pump, the, the water heater itself doesn't work. You really want it in a room that's always 50 degrees or warmer if possible. So, you know, with these parameters and following the instructions uh, of the uh, manufacturers, this is often a great solution. They're also tall, so you can't put one in a crawl space. Uh, if you don't have the conditions or the situation or the room in your house to use a heat pump water heater, I think an electric resistance water heater is a good solution. You know, especially if you balance it with PV. So this is options on where you put it. There's a minimum volume of the room where you can put one. So these minimum volume numbers are provided by the manufacturers. You know, it's, I think it's about, uh, I want to say it's about 1,000 cubic feet, but I have to look it up. It depends on the manufacturer. It varies somewhat from manufacturer to manufacturer. So include PV. Okay, we're running up against time here, but I think PV is a great investment. Uh, my brother put in a PV system in Roslindale, Massachusetts, and he, his payback period is five years. Why is it five years? Because Massachusetts has these SREC checks where they actually mail you a check once a year. In addition to the fact that he's getting free electricity, he's getting a check from Massachusetts. Um, it's unbelievable incentives in Massachusetts. Those incentives and the SREC payment amount changes year by year. I was talking to a gentleman in the lobby just today who said, oh, I calculated the return on investment. It's only an 8% and the payback takes 13 years. Well, how many of us know an investment with 8% tax-free return? We don't have many investments like that. He doesn't like it. He doesn't want to wait 13 years. The fact is this is a great investment. If you can afford it as a homeowner, by all means do it, especially if you have a net metering agreement that is at all reasonable. Um, it, it does, I mean, if you live in a state where the utility is being really anti-solar, it may not make sense, but in most cases it's a great investment. Future policy changes can occur, you know, your payment or the value of your production depends on what the utility thinks it's worth. Don't install oversized plumbing pipes. This is a little counterintuitive, but if you are waiting for hot water in a remote faucet, you don't want three-quarter copper line. You know, I used to think when I was starting out, well, you know, I want a great plumbing system. Instead of running half-inch copper, I'm going to run three-quarter copper. Well, you have a higher volume of hot water that has to run through that faucet before the water from the water heater gets there. So more and more people are saying, well, three-eighths will work. Now, whether or not you can use 3 eighths for an individual application depends on your local plumbing code. But believe it or not, small diameter tubing makes sense for remote hot water faucets. Keep that in mind. Lighting, no recessed cans. If you've got to have something that looks like a recessed can, use those new pancake fixtures from, that are LEDs that look like recessed cans without really being recessed cans. And this is counterintuitive, but uplighting is better than downlighting. And, you know, 
nicely uh, uh, lighted rooms usually have a white ceiling and a fixture with at least half the light or sometimes all the light bouncing off the ceiling. And what you end up with with all these recessed cans is you have little brightly lit spots on your floor. It's very unnatural to have a well-lit floor and a dark ceiling. What we really want and we are feeling of comfort, relaxation, and mimicking the natural world is we want a bright ceiling. That seems to make human beings feel like they're outdoors in the sunshine. So, you know, these dark patches on the ceiling are subtly affecting our mood and making us feel gloomy and then the end of the world is coming soon. <laughs> but if we got some up lighting and a nice white ceiling, it makes us all feel a little better. Last two points, don't overpromise. Net zero results depend on occupant behavior, so a builder cannot promise net zero. And a builder should never make health-related claims like this is a healthy house. We have no data that connects any features in a high-performance home with good health. So uh, promising health benefits to families is something you do not want to do. So that's it. I hope we had enough time. If people have more questions and want to come up informally, feel free. <laughs>